What's up guys, it's James Allen, the out-of-state investor, and today we're gonna continue with our mini-series and get into part four of how to buy a rental property, where I'm gonna talk about establishing your buying criteria getting your leads, and teach you how to do some serious real estate analysis as you're analyzing potential deals. If you learn how to do this the right way, you'll buy good deals, avoid the bad ones, and start to generate cash flow every single month. If you're just tuning in and you haven't seen parts one to three of this series yet, go ahead and make sure to watch those videos as well to get a full perspective on how to buy a rental property. I've attached links to those episodes in the description below. Now before I get started, go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to the channel to get notified for new real estate videos like this one. With that said, let's get started. In order to start getting leads and analyzing deals, you first need to establish your buying criteria. For buying criteria, you're gonna to have to explain to your realtor and wholesaler exactly what it is you're looking for. I recommend taking time to figure this out before you meet with your team members so that they know that you're taking this process seriously. There's nothing worse than sitting down with an agent, having them ask you what it is you're looking for, and you just stare back at them with a blank face saying, I don't know, what do you think? This tells them you're not a serious investor and it's not a good first impression to make. For buying criteria, you're gonna to want to know exactly what it is you're looking for when it comes to property type, price point, number of beds and baths, square footage, year built, and property condition. For property type, I recommend starting off with single family or two to four unit multifamily properties. For single family, I like to go with two or three bed houses. I also recommend asking your property manager if they see a stronger rental demand for a three bed or a two bed house in your area. Four bed houses and beyond are normally not a good idea because there's rarely a strong demand for those kind of rentals and you won't get much more rent for that extra fourth bedroom either. Price point should ideally be under $150,000 and preferably under $100,000 if you really wanna see some decent cash flow. For multifamily, I recommend sticking to properties where the majority of units have two or more bedrooms. This will give you less turnover, which is a good thing because multifamily already sees a high turnover rate compared to single family. For multifamily, it's hard to give you a good price point to target because it really depends on so many different things. For me, it really comes down to the cash on cash return to determine if it's a good deal or not. For square footage on a single family, I normally like to go for at least a thousand square feet on a three bed with 1100 square feet being even more preferable. Whereas on a two bed, I can work with 750 square feet or more. For a year built, the big thing to keep in mind is that the older you get, the more maintenance you're gonna be dealing with and you may need to start seriously addressing issues with the plumbing and electrical. Houses built after 1980 are great to target if you're looking for something with less to worry about. The houses built after 1980 are less susceptible to major problems you could come across, including things like lead-based paint, asbestos, aluminum wiring, and galvanized steel plumbing to just mention a few. With that said, I still buy older properties, but it's important to be aware of what an older property comes with. Last thing to figure out is your property condition. A property in turnkey condition is one option and it's exactly how it sounds. It's normally in perfect condition with everything fixed up for you so that all you have to do is literally just turn the key. Normally it's either priced at market value or a little higher than market value and you'll get lower returns on your cash flow but it's gonna be a more passive investment for you and it'll take a lot less work on your end. So for someone trying to find a property with minimal work, this could be a great option for you. With that said, I personally recommend going for a property with a value add element. Cosmetic fixer uppers can be great properties to buy and can be found at a discount price, plus they won't take crazy amounts of money to rehab compared with a complete gut job. These properties will come with an ugly or messed up kitchen, bathroom, flooring, and need a new paint maybe or other cosmetic fixes like that and they could be great houses to purchase below market value and then you can renovate them to force appreciation. So now that we talked about your buying criteria, let's talk about getting your leads. Your realtor and your wholesaler can be a great source of leads to get started. Ask your realtor to set you up with automatic email alerts. These will automatically notify you whenever a new property meeting your criteria hits the market. And it also gives you access to check out those listings on the MLS. This will be a great way to get started with getting leads sent your way. Other ways you can do this is you can also set up those same alerts on Zillow, Redfin, or Realtor.com. 
You can also filter your buying criteria and see what's on the market at that moment. For off-market deals, wholesalers will be your best bet to send you consistent deals. Every wholesaler has an email list that they have that they send deals out to. So make sure to give them your contact info so that they can add you to that list and start sending you deals on a consistent basis. Also, make sure you understand that most wholesalers want a quick close, which means that you're gonna to need to pay all cash for the deal. When a wholesaler gets a property under contract, they'll email that property to everybody on that email list, along with their estimates for rehab costs, what kind of rent it could bring in, and the after repair value. Now, as far as numbers go, completely ignore any estimates they wrote down. Wholesalers are notorious for exaggerated numbers, so you're gonna to wanna to know your own numbers if you're really Really going to mitigate risk on a property. So with that said, how do you figure out the numbers on a rental property and how do you know if it's a good deal? Well, those are good questions to ask and I'm glad you brought it up. So the most important thing you're going to look at when you're analyzing a rental property is the cash flow and the cash on cash return. Appreciation is also good to consider and there are definitely ways to increase your chances of that, which I did talk about in part two of this series, but really appreciation should be seen as the icing on the cake. When it comes to cash flow, you're just talking about what you make when you take your income minus your expenses. A good rental property will bring in enough income to be cash flowing after all expenses are covered. Now this may sound easy, but the expenses is honestly where most people screw it up. You see, most people will be like, my rental income on this property is $1,500 a month and my mortgage is only $1,100 a month, so that means I'm going to be cash flowing $400, right? Wrong! There's a lot of expenses you need to consider when you're running the numbers on a rental property. This includes your mortgage, your property taxes, your insurance, property management, maintenance, capex, vacancy, water, sewer, trash, electrical, gas, HOA fees, flood insurance, lawn care, and snow removal. Yep, it's a lot. I know it's a lot to remember. So right now what I want to do is I actually want to look at a deal that's literally on the market right now and I want to walk you through exactly how I analyze a deal and find out the cash flow, the cash on cash return, and whether I feel like it's a good deal or a bad deal. All right, guys, so I found this property that's on the market. It's in the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, which is an area that I invest in, and I'm actually familiar with this particular neighborhood, and it's a pretty decent area. It's been on the market eight days. Price point is 97,000, three beds, one and a half baths. 1404 square feet. It's a solid size for a rental property. So let's go ahead and uh, check out the pictures inside. And so as you can see, um, definitely a fixer upper of sorts. Um, definitely uh, room to add value. New paint, new flooring, fix those bathrooms, um, new light fixtures. So um, yeah, definitely room to force appreciation, and that is exactly what you want to look for uh, as an investor. It's built in 1971. Um, these are the expenses right here, but before I get into that, I want to go ahead and show you this. Now, this is a copy of uh, my cash flow spreadsheet. Now, I attached a link in the description below uh, so that you guys can utilize this and uh, analyze your own deals with this cash flow spreadsheet. And so all you gotta do is input your numbers, your income, your expenses. It gives you all the expenses you need to worry about so you don't forget anything, okay? And it will automatically calculate your monthly cash flow, your annual cash flow, and your cash on cash return, which is of course the most important metric when you're analyzing rental properties. So with that said, let's start with the rental income, okay? now. Aside from using your property management, which is of course the best way to go to get an idea of what your rental income will be, I do like to use this website called Rentometer. And I've already input the address in here. Um, and I've done it for um, three bed comparables over the last six months, uh, search radius of a mile and a half, uh, building type, house duplex. Of course, we're gonna focus on single family houses. Um, but it doesn't give us just that option. So uh, we're gonna use that for now. And um, it breaks down the average and the median rental income. So we can see our average is 1225 and our median is 1213, okay? Now the thing is, is 
I like to go off of the median rather than the average, okay? And the reason that is, is that for the average, it just takes a few of these houses to be much larger or, or maybe completely renovated for it to completely throw the average out of whack. And so that's why I prefer to go off of the median. Um, so with that said, let's, let's take a little deeper look here. Um, this is our property that we're analyzing, the little star there, okay? And I like to look at the properties that are closest to that uh, to our property. So these these ones are really close. Um, three beds, eleven twenty five for this one. So that's a little bit lower than our median. This one right here is eleven hundred. So that's two houses right there uh, that are a bit lower than our median price. Now there's this one. If it's red, that typically means it's just a lot uh, higher than the the median or average price. Uh, it's fourteen ninety five, which is quite a large jump. From these other two I was just looking at so that probably means I'm just guessing here but it probably just means that that house is a lot larger or updated something like that but the thing is we want to double check these things and the way we do that is we uh, take these addresses we copy and paste them into Google and there'll be links for like Zillow or Redfin that you can click on for those properties and um, and you can uh, check those stats or specs for the house you know is it a you know because a three bed could be a 900 square foot house it could be a 2000 square foot house a three bed could have a uh, one bath or it could have two and a half baths it could be completely updated it could be completely outdated so the thing is is that those things make a huge difference on the amount of rental income you bring in so you want to make sure you're double checking these things to make sure you have a accurate number that you're working with so for now, I'm gonna go with $1,100. That's the lowest I saw there, and I just wanna be extra conservative at the moment. So let's do 1100 okay. Um, now we're in our expenses, so let's go back over to Redfin. Now I used a 5.5% interest rate, that is the going rate at the moment. Um, our mortgage uh, is our principal and interest right here. So that's 441 a month. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Property taxes, 81 and 53 for homeowners insurance. Now, property taxes, you want to verify that number uh, by checking your county tax assessor's website. Okay, that will give you the actual property taxes for this property. Um, homeowners insurance, you want to verify that number by reaching out to insurance agents and getting actual quotes on the property. For now, we're gonna run with these numbers that they have here, but, uh, and a lot of times they're actually pretty accurate to be honest, but um, you just wanna be absolutely certain that these are accurate numbers you're working with. So, with that said, let's continue. Uh, property management, I'm gonna use about 10% um, of the rental income for that number. Now my property management actually only charges me 8%, but I like to use 10% and give it that extra 2% just for extra fees like the leasing fees or uh, leasing re lease renewals and extra things like that that come along with property management. I just wanna budget that in to my numbers. So then I have maintenance, that's just all the little repairs that are needed throughout ownership. Uh, I'm gonna budget about 7% um, of my rental income on that. Um, vacancy. Your property is going to get vacant at some point, and so you want to budget for that. Um, now, I like to do about eight uh, percent for vacancy. I may see less than that, but um, you know, for me, I think budgeting about a month's time. Uh, eight percent is roughly about a month's worth of vacancy, so I'll budget about eight percent. Capex. That stands for capital expenditures, which is basically your major repairs, things like the roof or the HVAC, major things like that. They're going to cost you a lot of money. You don't want to just go down ten years down the road and all of a sudden uh, you you get hit with a major roof expense and then you lose all the cash flow you've been making up until then. You want to budget that into your cash flow so that it doesn't come as a surprise down the road. So I'm going to budget another seven percent. For my capital expenditures. Now, typically in my area and most areas, um, utilities are going to be on the tenant to pay. Okay, so for me, that includes water, sewer, electrical, gas. Trash is paid by the city in my area. Um, lawn care and all that is going to be on the tenant as well. There are no HOAs um, for this property. So, with that said, all these utility costs are going to typically fall on the tenant's responsibility. 
But if you get a multifamily, two to four unit property, or even above that, then lawn care is now going to be the responsibility of the landlord. And water, if you haven't sub-metered your water meters, then that is going to be a responsibility of the landlord. Unless you have sub-metered it and gotten every single person a water meter, or every single unit a water meter, uh, then at that point you can put it back on your tenants. Um, now for down payment, let's let's figure these last costs out right now. Down payment, um, you have to put down a minimum of 20% down on a single family investment property. So that puts us at $19,400 down. Closing costs on a $97,000 property, I'm going to say about $4,500 there. Inspection, I'm going to do $350. Um, rehab, um, on a 1,400 square foot home, cosmetic renovation, I'm gonna say about 20 grand, maybe 21 grand um, for this rehab, okay? So that puts us at about a 4.59% cash on cash return. So, but how do we calculate that, right? <laughs> so I, I, just, I just got this automatic number that popped up, but I wanna show you how I did it, okay? All you do to figure out your cash on cash return is you take your annual cash flow number. This is what you make in cash flow per year, 2076, and you divide it by your total all in cost. That's your $45,250 because that's totaling your down payment, closing costs, inspection, and rehab altogether. That's your total money that you're putting into the property. Okay? And when you take 2076, divide it by 45,250, you get 4.59%. So the question is, is that a good deal? Well, for me, I would say it's not. Um, I like to aim for typically at least a 10% return on investment or above, um, with the exception being that if I do find a property that's in a very promising area with lots of upside to it, maybe lots of gentrification going on in the area, um, very up and coming area for whatever reason, then I may be willing to go down to an 8% return on investment on that property. Uh, but the reason why 4.59% isn't going to cut it for me is because it's not hard to get 6 to 8% returns on the stock market, and that's a much more passive way of making money than real estate. So if I could make that much money on stocks, then 4.59%, I don't know that it's going to be worth my time at that point to do that. So anyways, uh, hopefully this has made it a lot more helpful uh, breaking this down for you guys and uh, maybe you guys get a better understanding of how to run the numbers now on a rental property. Um, but let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. In conclusion, whenever you're analyzing a potential rental property, remember that it all starts with the cash flow and cash on cash return. Other things you want to look into when you're analyzing a deal is what kind of opportunity there is for appreciation. Are you overpaying for the property, which you can actually have your agent run a CMA or a comparative market analysis to get an idea of this. And most importantly, understand what the property location is like. Because while you can change how a property looks like on the inside and out, you can't do anything about the location it's in. I also attached a free spreadsheet link in the description below that you can use to calculate your cash flow numbers with. With that said, I hope you enjoyed today's video. These days I'm posting new videos like this one every Friday. So be sure to check those out and stay connected to the channel. If you did find some value in today's video, go ahead and do me a favor and smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button below and let me know what your biggest takeaway was in the comment section. Also, if you want to stay up to date with me, follow me on my Instagram page at the out of state investor. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next one.